when Gandalfs are likewise used up, even though they had no part in it. But you should also know that one can still occasionally find certain of your favorites whose planetary existence lasts up to five of their centuries. You will then surely understand that in the case of certain of your favorites, even of recent times, who somehow find out and correctly assimilate in their reason certain details concerning the law of associations proceeding in the separate brains of beings, as well as the reciprocal action of these independent associations, and who exist more or less in conformity with this law, the Bob and Candelnos formed in their separate being brains are not used up, and they thus acquire the possibility of existing much longer than the other three brain beings on that planet. During my last stay there, I personally met several of these terrestrial contemporary three-brained beings who were already two or three, or even four of their centuries old. I met them chiefly in a small brotherhood, composed of beings from almost all of their religions, whose her man and place of existence was in the middle of the continent of Asia. The members of that brotherhood, so it seems, discovered the mentioned law of associations in being brains partly by themselves and partly thanks to information that reached them from ancient times through genuine initiates. As for the beings of the contemporary community of England, who have become the chief victims of that particularly maleficent invention of the beings of the ancient Greek civilization, they not only practice it in the process of their own existence but they try as hard as they can to infect the beings of all the other communities with this same evil moreover, by this maleficent sport of theirs, these unfortunates not only diminish still further the already trifling duration of their own existence but, in my opinion, they will eventually bring about the same fate for their community as quite recently befell a large community their name, Russia. I thought about this just before my final departure from that planet, when I learned that the power-possessing beings of this no less great contemporary community of England were beginning to utilize that maleficent sport for their own Hathnamusian aims, exactly as the power-possessing beings of the community of Russia utilized for the same aim the famous question of vodka. Just as the power-possessing beings of Russia then tried, by every kind of artifice, to instill into the weak wills of the ordinary beings the necessity for the intensive use of this vodka, so the power-possessing beings of England are now maneuvering in every way to infatuate the ordinary beings of their community with this sport of theirs. The forebodings that then arose in me are it seems, already being justified. And I draw this conclusion from the etherogram I recently received from the planet Mars informing me, among other things, that although there are more than two and a half million of what are called unemployed beings in that community of England, the power-possessing beings, there take no measures concerning this, but only endeavor to spread still more widely among them that famous sport of theirs. Just as in the large community of Russia all the newspapers and magazines used to publish countless articles on the question of vodka, so now in the community of England more than half the contents of all these sowers of evil, are devoted to that famous, sport. Quote, Chapter 30, Art. At this place in his tales, Beelzebub became silent. Then turning suddenly to his old servant Ahun, who was sitting there listening as attentively as his grandson Hassan, Beelzebub said, 
What's this? Old oh, man. Are you really listening to me with as much interest as our Hussein? Weren't you there yourself? And didn't you go with me everywhere on that planet Earth? And didn't you see with your own eyes and sense for yourself everything I am telling him about? Instead of just sitting there open mouthed at my tales, why don't you also tell our favorite something? There is no getting out of it. Since those strange free-brained beings interest him so greatly, we have to tell him all we can about them. Surely something or other about those freaks must have struck you. Well, whatever it was, tell us about that. On hearing these words, Ahun thought a little and replied. After your subtly psychological tales about all these muddle heads, what can I add with my stories? But then, with unaccustomed seriousness and borrowing the style and even entire expressions of Beelzebub himself, he went on. Well now, how shall I put it? My essence was often thrown off balance by those strange three-brained beings, and their foolish capers nearly always evoked the being impulse of amazement in one or another of my spiritualized parts. And then addressing Hassan, he said, All right, dear Hassan. I shall not, like his right reverence, tell you in detail about any particular oddity of the psyche of those three brain beings of our great universe who has taken your fancy no, I shall only remind his right reverence of a certain factor whose origin goes back to the time of our fifth stay on the surface of that planet, and which, when we return there for the sixth and last time, had become the chief reason why, in every one of your favorites, from the first day of their arising until their formation as responsible beings, their capacity for normal, being mentation, is distorted step by step, and is finally transformed almost into a cultusuru. Quote. Thereupon, turning to the Elzebub, with a timid look and in a hesitant tone he continued, don't blame me, your right reverence, if I venture to express to you an opinion that has just arisen in me and that is the outcome of data perhaps already worn too thin for being conclusions. In telling our dear Hassan the various reasons why the psyche of the contemporary free brain beings of the planet Earth has been transformed, as you once deigned to express it, into a mill for grinding out nonsense, you scarcely even mention one factor which, perhaps more than any other, has contributed to this during recent centuries. You yourself were present, as I well remember, at the arising of that factor during our stay in Babylon. I mean that factor which has since become definitely maleficent for the contemporary beings there and which they themselves call, are, sing their toe. If, in your wisdom, you should consent to take up that question in detail, then, it seems to me, our dear Hassan would have the ideal material for elucidating all the peculiar abnormalities of the psyche of the three brain beings arising in most recent times on that planet Earth which interests him. Having said this, and wiping the drops of sweat from his forehead with the tip of his tail, Ahun became silent and resumed his usual expectant posture. Turning to him with an affectionate glance, Beelzebub said, Thank you old man, for reminding me of this. It is true that I have scarcely mentioned the harmful factor they themselves created, which led to the final atrophy of those data for their being mentation that had by chance still survived in them. All the same, old 
friend, although it is true that I have scarcely referred to it so far, this does not mean that I have not considered it we have ample time before us on our journey and, in all probability, in the course of my later tales to our common favorite Hassane, I would have remembered in due time what you have just reminded me about. However, perhaps it is opportune to speak just now about this contemporary terrestrial art, because, as you have said, during our fifth stay there, I actually witnessed the events that gave rise to the causes of this contemporary evil, and that occurred thanks again to those learned beings who were gathered in the city of Babylon from almost the whole surface of that ill-fated planet. Quote, Beelzebub then turned to Hassan and spoke as follows. This definite concept, now existing there under the name of art, is one of those automatically acting data, the totality of which gradually and almost imperceptibly, yet very surely, converts these unhappy favorites of yours, beings who have in their presence all the possibilities for becoming particles of a part of divinity, merely into what is called, live meat. In order to throw light on all aspects of the question of this famous contemporary terrestrial art, and for your clear understanding of how it all came about, you must first know about two facts relating to what occurred in the city of Babylon during our fifth visit in person to the surface of that planet of yours. The first fact explains how and why I came to be a witness of those events which serve as the basis for the existence among contemporary free-brained beings of the planet Earth of that now definitely maleficent notion called art, and the second is related to the earlier circumstances which, in their turn, were the origin of these events. Concerning the first of these facts, I must tell you that after the events which occurred among those learned terrestrial free brain beings who had come to Babylon from almost the whole planet, that is to say, after they had split into several independent groups and had become absorbed, as I have already told you, in the question of holidays, I resolved to leave Babylon and continue my observations among the beings of the powerful community called Pelos. I therefore decided to learn their language without delay, and from then on I began to visit those places in the city of Babylon frequented by those beings who would be most useful to me in this study. One day, as I was walking along a certain street not far from our house I noticed on a large building I had often passed what is called on the earth a signboard, which had just been put up, announcing that in that building a new club for foreign learned beings had just been opened, called the Adherence of Legomanism. On the door was a notice to the effect that the enrollment of members of the club was still going on, and that all reports and scientific discussions would be conducted only in the local and Hellenic languages. This interested me very much, and at once I thought of the possibility of making use of this newly opened club for practice in the Hellenic language. I then asked certain beings who were going in and out of the building for particulars concerning the club, and when, thanks to the explanation of one of these learned beings with whom, as it turned out, I was already acquainted, I had made it all more or less clear to myself, I then and there decided to become a member. Without thinking long about it, I entered the building and, passing myself off as a foreign learned being, I asked to be enrolled as an adherent of Legomanism I managed to do this very easily, owing to that acquaintance whom I had met by chance and who, like the others, took me for a learned being like himself. Well, 
my boy, having thus become, as they say, a full member of this club, I began to go there regularly, chiefly to talk with those learned members who were familiar with the Hellenic language I needed to practice. Now as regards the second fact I mentioned, this was due to the following events. You must remember that among the learned beings who were then gathered in Babylon from almost the whole planet, some had been brought there by coercion by the aforementioned Persian king, and others had come of their own accord, drawn by that famous question of the soul and among the beings brought there by coercion were some who were not, like the majority, learned beings of new formation, but who, with a sincerity proceeding from their separate spiritualized parts, strove for high knowledge with the sole aim of self-perfection. Owing to their genuine and sincere strivings, to the corresponding manner of their existence, and to their being acts, this small number of beings, even before their arrival in Babylon, had been considered initiates of the first degree by those terrestrial free-brained beings worthy to become. All rites possessing initiates according to the renewed rules of the most saintly Ashiata Shemash. And thus, my boy, when I began frequenting this club, it became evident to me, both from conversations with its members and from other data, that these few terrestrial learned beings, who were sincerely striving to perfect their reason, had from the beginning kept to themselves in the city of Babylon, and never mixed in any of the affairs in which the general mass of Babylonian scholars very soon became involved. These few learned beings kept themselves apart, not only in the beginning when all the others established a meeting place in the very heart of Babylon, where for their better mutual support, both material and moral, they founded a central club for all the learned beings of the earth, but also later on, when the whole body of learned beings split into three separate sections, each having its independent club in a different part of the city, these initiated beings identified themselves with none of the three sections. They existed in the suburbs and scarcely ever met any of the main body of learned beings, and it was only a few days before I was admitted as a member that they united for the first time for the purpose of organizing the club of the adherents of legomanism. Single quote. These few learned beings I am speaking of had all without exception been brought to the city of Babylon by coercion and were for the most part among those taken by the Persian king from Egypt. As I learned later, this union of theirs had been brought about by two learned beings who were initiates of the first degree. One of these two terrestrial initiates, who had his arising among a race of beings called the Moors, was named Camiel Norco. The other learned initiate was named Pythagoras, who had his arising among the Hellenes, those who were afterward called Greeks. These two learned beings, as it later became clear to me, happened to meet in the city of Babylon and, during what is called an Awasapagamian exchange of opinions, that is, during one of their conversations, the question arose, which forms of being existence can serve the welfare of beings of the future? They came to the conclusion that in the course of changing generations of beings on the earth a very lamentable phenomenon occurs, namely, that for some reason or other during the processes of reciprocal destruction called wars and popular uprisings, numbers of initiated beings of all degrees are invariably destroyed and, 
together with them. There are also destroyed forever many legomanisms, the sole means by which information about former real events on the earth is transmitted and continues to be transmitted from generation to generation. When these two sincere and honest terrestrial beings ascertained what they considered so lamentable a phenomenon, they deliberated a long time and decided to take advantage of the exceptional gathering of so many learned beings in the same city to confer together for the purpose of finding some means of averting at least this distressing phenomenon, which proceeded on the earth owing to the abnormal conditions of the life of man. And it was for this very purpose that they organized that club and called it the Club of the Adherence of Legomanism. So many life-thinking beings at once responded to their appeal that two days after my admission, the enrollment of new members was closed. And on the day when new members were no longer admitted, the number enrolled was 139, and the club continued with this same number of members until the Persian king abandoned his praise concerning those terrestrial learned beings. As I learned on joining the club, all the members present on the opening day had organized a general meeting, at which it had been unanimously decided to hold a daily general meeting for reports and discussions dealing exclusively with the two following questions first, what measures should be taken by the members of the club on their return home in order to collect all the legomanisms existing in their native lands and to place them at the disposal of the learned members of the club? And second, what is to be done in order that the legomanisms might be transmitted to remote generations by some other means than through initiates alone? Before my enrollment as a member, there had already been a great variety of reports and discussions concerning those two questions at their general meetings, and on the day of my admission a great deal was said on the question of how to attract, for the fundamental task of the club, the participation of initiated beings from among the followers of various castes who were then known as Onanjiki, Shamanists, Buddhists, and so on. Well then, it was on the third day after I became a member of this club that there was uttered for the first time that word which has chanced to reach contemporary beings there and which has become one of the potent factors in the final atrophy of all the data still surviving in them for more or less normal logical being mentation, namely, the word, art, which then had quite another meaning and referred to an entirely different idea. On that day when the word, art, was uttered for the first time and its underlying idea and exact meaning were established, there was listed among the speakers a Chaldean learned being, very well known in those times, named Aksharpansiar. As the report of that already very aged Chaldean sage, the great Aksharpansiar was the origin of all the subsequent events relating to that famous contemporary art. I will try to recall his speech and repeat it to you as nearly as possible word for word. He spoke as follows. Past centuries, and especially the two last ones, have shown us that during those inevitable psychoses of the masses leading to wars between states and popular revolts within states, it invariably happens that many of the innocent victims of the collective bestiality are those very beings who, owing to their piety and conscious sacrifices, are worthy to become initiates, and through whom various legomanisms containing information about real events that have taken place in the past could be transmitted to the conscious beings of succeeding generations. 
pious men as these always become the innocent victims of the popular bestiality because, in my opinion, being already free within, they never really identify themselves, as all the others do, with ordinary interests, and cannot share in the attractions, enthusiasms, and sentiments, or any other manifestation of those around them, however sincere. Because these pious men exist normally, and in their relations with those around them are always well-wishing in both their inner and outer manifestations, in ordinary times they acquire the respect and esteem of everyone but when the mass of people fall into this psychosis and split into their usual two opposing camps, their reason becomes bestialized by the fighting, and they begin to entertain morbid suspicions of just these men who in normal times have always been unassuming and serious. And if the attention of those afflicted with this psychosis happens to rest a little longer than usual on these exceptional men, they then have no doubt whatever that these serious and outwardly quiet beings have been, even in normal times, neither more nor less than, spies, for their present enemies. With their diseased reason these brutalized men categorically conclude that the seriousness and quietness of these beings were simply, secrecy, and, duplicity. Quote, and no matter to which hostile party they belong, the result of their psychopathic conclusions is that, without any remorse of conscience whatsoever, they put these serious and quiet men to death. This, it seems to me, is the most frequent reason why, in the course of their transmission from generation to generation, the legomanisms about events that really took place on this planet are totally disappearing from the face of the Earth. And so, my highly esteemed colleagues, if you wish to know my personal opinion, let me tell you sincerely with all my being that, in spite of everything I have said as regards the transmission of true knowledge to distant generations through corresponding initiates by means of legomanism, there is nothing whatever that can be changed. Let this form of transmission continue as before, as it has been established on the Earth since the dawn of centuries, and as this form of transmission by initiates through their ableness to be, was renewed by the great prophet Ashiata Shemash. But if we men of today now wish to render some benefit to men of future times, all we must do is add to this existing means of transmission some new means or other, ensuing from the practices of our contemporary life on the earth as well as from the experience of former generations over many centuries, in accordance with information that has come down to us. I personally suggest that this transmission to future Generations be carried out through the human, apostleness, as they are called, that is, through various works of man's hands which have entered into the everyday life of people, and also through the human, soldinogus, that is, through various procedures and ceremonies which have been established for centuries in the social and family life of people and which pass automatically from generation to generation. Certain of these human, apocalypse, particularly those made of lasting materials, may remain intact and be handed down to our remote posterity, or copies may pass from generation to generation, thanks to the property rooted in man's essence of giving out as his own, after having changed some minor detail, works that have reached him from long past epochs. In regard to the human, Solvinokas, such as various, mysteries, religious ceremonies, family and social customs, 
religious and popular dances, and so on, although their external